a warm welcome to one and all. We today we are going to start our Springer's author workshop. The chief resource person for this is Dr. Akash Chakrabarti, associate editor, Applied Science and Engineering, Springer Nature. Akash Chakrabarti is associate editor of Applied Science. Sciences and Engineering at Springer. He obtained his PhD in Theoretical Condensed Matter Physics from the Institute Neil, CNRS, Grenoble, France. Following which he was employed as an early stage researcher in KIT, Kalshre, Jacobs University, Bremen, Germany, and then as a postdoctoral research at the University of Regensburg in Germany. His research primarily focused on the magnetic properties of disordered systems and their applications in the emerging field of spintronics. During his brief research career, he has published several articles in journal publications published by the American Physical Society, IOP public Publishing, Elsewhere, and Springer. At Springer, Akash is responsible for acquiring and managing a growing portfolio of books and journals within the physical sciences and engineering domain and building a strong and productive network among new and established institutes of higher education and research in the country. It's over to you, sir. He's taking over. OK, thanks for the introduction. And of course, I would like to first thanks, thank the organizer, Dr. Bhivudu Das, for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to be here. And of course, this is my first time that I'm in uh, NIT Suratkal. We've got a very nice campus, I must say. It's really green, which is because I come from Delhi, you know, so I don't see a lot of greenery there. Anyway. Yes, so before I start, yeah, just a couple of ground rules which I always like to mention uh, before we really get started. The first one is no talking amongst yourselves, all right? Please, if you have really something urgent to discuss, please go outside the auditorium. And the second one is mobile phones. Please keep it silent mode. You should check mine as well. Right. OK, so now this workshop is actually uh, probably, I, I don't know if it was mentioned. This is mainly intended for PhD students and young researchers, postdocs, and people like them. So I would like to know how many of you present here are PhD students. If you don't mind raising your hands. All right, that's a good majority. Fine, that's good. And any postdoctoral fellows, postdoctoral researchers? None. Any master students? And grad students? Okay, few there. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. I'll, okay, so let's get started first. So actually, the, the ultimate, the primary goal of this workshop is not only to be, a, to be an author, okay, not only to get published, but the idea is that how, to, how do you become an effective communicator? Okay. So how do you communicate, how do you convey your study, the relevance and the significance of your study to your readers? And to do that, what you need is, the first thing is, of course, you need to logically organize your ideas throughout the manuscript so that your readers, they clearly understand what is the, what is the utility, what is the impact of your study. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, of course, you need a very good and efficient publication strategy, which involves, you know, like choosing the right journal for your work, so that you reach the target audience that you that you wish to uh, aim at. And the third one is, of course, successful. How to successfully navigate through the peer review system. So, how do you actually make sure that once you submit your work in a journal, how do you actually make sure that you actually get published? So these are the three main things, the three main parts that we are going to look at in this, uh, in this talk, in this seminar. Uh, well, I'm going to, I know, I hope you're all settled down after lunch. I'm going to try to keep you awake. I'm not sure if I'll succeed. But this, this, uh, this whole thing is, uh, workshop is supposed to be interactive, all right? So if you have any questions during the course of the talk, please feel free to raise your hands or shout out, okay? I would also try to ask you a few questions in the in the course of the of this uh, of this seminar. So before we actually work here. So before we actually move on to the main part, I'll just give a very brief and a quick introduction to what is uh, or who is Springer Nature. So 
So what happened is in May 2015, Springer Science and Macmillan Education, they merged and they formed a company called Springer Nature. So the, now the mother, mother company is called Springer Nature. And of course, so we publish some of the major imprints in academic and scholarly publishing, which includes, as you can see, Biomed Central, Springer, Nature Research, Scientific American, Paul Graves, stuff like that. So let's talk about uh, a little bit of the background. So of course, it's a very, very old company. So Springer, was, Springer itself was founded in 1842 by Julius Springer in Berlin. So it's not only a very old company, it's also a pretty big one. We have more than 13,000 employees based globally to cater to the needs of our authors and readers. Okay? Of course, we are the largest academic publisher in the world right now. So we publish annually more than 13,000, uh, almost 13,000 books and more than 3,000 journals. And of course, uh, out of these journals, most 600, nearly 600 of them are open access journals. Uh, we're going to talk about open access later on in, this, uh, in, the, in the later sections. And uh, of course, our, the, two, the two online platforms that we have, Springer, Springerlink and Nature.com, they cumulatively they receive a download of more than 250 million a year, which is significant, as you can understand. So this shows that if you publish with Springer Nature, of course, you have a very high chance, a high probability of uh, being read and being cited. All right. And uh, lastly, of course, most of the Nobel laureates, uh, Till up to, I can remember, I think it was 2015 or 2016, uh, all the Nobel laureates, they had already published in Springer Nature journals before they had actually become Nobel laureates. Okay? So that's a bit of the background. Now to talk about the journal portfolio. So as I said, we already, we published more than 3,000 journals. So out of which, uh, there are about 1,800 hybrid journals. So do you know what a hybrid journal is? How many of you don't know what a hybrid journal is? So hybrid journal is something which uh, gives you, which has option of open access, all right? So it's basically a subscription-based journal, but you also have the choice of open access, but it's optional. So it's not mandatory, unlike open access journals, which are, which are only open access. So hybrid journal, which, which is actually subscription-based, but it gives you the option of open access. So that's, that's what we call a, call a hybrid journal. And if you look at this pie here, so this gives a, a, just a distribution of the articles that we published in 2016, so which was more than 344,000. So out of those, uh, more than half of it were published in hybrid journals, and uh, one-fifth of them were published in fully open access journals, so only, only open access. And apart from that, of course, out of the top 25 journals, like by ranking, by impact factor-wise, 10 out of the 25 ones, they are actually Springer Nature branded journals. Okay? So this is about the journal uh, side. Of course, talking about books, uh, this, this is a 2015 data. So this shows that, of course, compared to the other publishers, the major publishers that we have, we are like way, way ahead. And of course, as you can see, so this is the, actually the number of books that were published in 2015. So science and technology, this part, it forms a, forms a significant chunk of the books we publish. Okay, and uh, what do we publish? Of course, we publish a wide variety of academic literature, which as you can see here, so it's not only about journal articles or books. We publish a lot of review, review articles. There is a lot of... Uh, uh, the proceedings as well, I mean, as you probably know, the proceedings of this, uh, this conference, uh, ICSCBM, will also be published by Springer, the select proceedings, so which will come out after the conference. Of course, we also have a lot of handbooks, reference books, and we have something called the databases, which is one is Nature Nano and the other one is Springer Materials, which is also very, very useful. I'm not sure if you have access uh, here. Uh, do they have access to? No, not yet. Okay. All right. So anyway, so this yeah, this shows that we try to cater to all kinds of uh, all kinds of readers and all kinds of authors. So of course, yeah, if you have any ideas, any proposals, you just feel free to connect with us. Okay. So that was yeah, that was just the brief introduction. So let's yeah, let's move on to the to the main part of it. So first, we will of course we'll start with the with the manuscript. All right. So now I my my first question is that why do we publish? Why do you think, what is the utility of publishing? You know, like, okay, you're doing your research, you're doing experiments, you're happy with it. Why do you think that, why is it important to publish? To communicate Sorry? To communicate the ideas. To communicate the ideas, all right, to... Okay, that's one thing. Anything else, anyone? Well, it's kind of related, right? Yeah, to communicate, you, you can communicate, you want to share what you're doing, right? Sorry? 
validate your work, yeah, that's true. Sorry? To get peer review, yeah, is that the, the whole objective of publishing? Yeah, it's part, it's part of the publishing process, right? Yes, it's part of the publishing process. Well, of course, yeah, the main reason is that if, you, if you're, just, you're just doing your research, all right, and you don't publish it, so it's basically no good. Because if nobody really knows what you're doing, nobody gets to know it, then what good does it serve? So it's basically you're just doing it for fun, you're just doing it as a hobby, isn't it? If you're not able to communicate, or if you don't communicate what you're doing, or if people, the scientific community, the academic community, they don't know what you're doing, then there is no point. So the whole idea is, the a, your, your goal should be to publish your work, and not only to publish your work, to make sure that it makes an impact. So how does it make an impact? So you have to make sure that people are aware of what you're doing, people are reading what you're doing, and once people read what you're doing, they'll only cite your work, all right? So the idea is to, as I already mentioned, to effectively communicate the significance of your work. So that's the main reason why, why we actually, why we should publish and why we do publish we, what, we, what we do. Okay, so let's see. So the first, uh, to be uh, an effective communicator, so you have to keep in mind, uh, of course, uh, the readers, your readers, right? Because they are the audience, they are the people who are going to read about your work. So your readers, they have, uh, what we say is they have basically four key questions in mind. So the first one is, of course, why? Obviously, why did you do the study? So what was the reason behind? What was the motivation behind? The second one is, what did you exactly do? Of course, the third one is, what did you find, your findings? And the fourth one is, of course, how, how does it affect, how, what kind of impact or significance does it have on your subject, on your field, okay? Now, in order to address these four key questions of your readers, the, your manuscript should ideally be divided into four major sections, which are the introduction, method, results, and discussion. So we call it the IMRAD model, all right? So introduction, methods, result, discussion. So these are the four major parts, the four major sections in which your manuscript should ideally be divided so as to address these four key questions of, of, your, of your readers. Hmm? So now in the, in the following slides, we're going to look at each one of them individually, okay? Yeah, I'll just wait for the guys to settle down, so. Okay, so let's move on then. So the first, of course, the first thing is uh, when you start your manuscript, the first thing obviously which, which comes is the introduction, right? So with the introduction, we try to, we would ideally like to look at it as an inverted pyramid, all right? So basically you start broad and then you guide your readers to your specific aims, to the goals of your study, okay? Your primary objective. So when you start, of course, what you usually do is you talk about, a, you give a back background of your, of your subject. Of course, not, you don't start, don't start giving a, you know, like a literature survey, don't write pages about it. But just give enough uh, information so that the reader gets the context of your study and he understands, the reader understands that, okay, what is, what is the necessary background required to understand what follows. Okay, so now if you're talking about uh, international, so if you're thinking about submitting in an international journal, so be sure that you cite broadly. Okay, so don't just cite your own papers or your supervisor's paper. So try to cite as widely as possible. The other thing which we always say is try to cite as many reviews as possible when you're, when you're, thinking, of the, when you're thinking of writing the introduction. Because people who are interested in the subject, they can always refer back to the reviews. Okay, so they can always go back to the reviews if they want to learn more about the topic. So that's, that's why you should ideally cite uh, as many reviews as possible and up-to-date reviews as possible, not really like outdated ones which were published like 50, 60 years ago, fine? And then again, if you're submitting in a, in a very broad focus journal, so you have to give a very wider introduction because you have to keep in mind that the readership is actually not, they might not be directly from your field, not from your immediate field of work, they might be broader. So of course you should give a general introduction, but if you're thinking of submitting in a very focused, in a very specialized journal, then of course you need not give a very wide background, very wide introduction because you expect that the readers of, of that particular journal, they are familiar more or less with the, with the background of that particular topic, okay? So once you have done, done that, so the next thing is, of course, 
what is, you talk about what is known about the topic. So what has already been done, what has recently been published, so what, what have people looked into, okay, because then people understand that, okay, fine, what are the things which have been already done, what, what kind of work people have recently published, so what is going on, like in, you know, like in, it's more like a state of the art, what is the current status of that subject. So once you discuss, once you tell people what is known, already known about the topic, obviously the next thing which comes is what is not known. So and this is very important because this is what is not known. So this actually leads you to your goal, so which is your specific aim of the study. Because when you say that, okay, so this, this, this has been done or this has been found or this has been observed. However, these things have not been done or this thing was not observed or if there is something controversial, let's say something debatable which has not been resolved yet and you wish to look into that, okay? So you wish to clarify that. So this is something which leads you directly to your aim, to the, to the specific goal of your study. And this should be, remember that this aim, the goal, this should be directly, it should really address the question that or the unknown facts that you have mentioned which has not been resolved yet or which has not been found yet. Okay. So here I would like to uh, mention something. So when you are talking about, you know, like, I mean, yeah, there's a good many, uh, good number of PhD students here. So when you're talking about PhDs, you know, starting, you're starting your PhDs and uh, doing research, a big question which always comes is, how do you decide what you do? Okay, what do you work on? So basically you have to identify some topics and preferably some hot topics which nobody else is working on or if they are working on there is a lot of interest in the subject. Definitely you don't want to work in something which has already been discovered like 100 years ago and then there is not much to do in that field because more or less everything is clear and everything is uh, well understood, right? So now in order, to, in order to understand or in order to rather identify potential fields or potential problems, uh, of course, the easy solution is that your supervisor tells you what to do. That's fine. That's very good. But even then, are you sure that you really want to work on that? Are you sure that you are, you are interested to work on that? Are you sure that you have enough background knowledge or background information to address the research problem? So as, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how many of you were present in the morning session today, so as Professor Nanan was speaking that a lot of times what happens is that students are asked to do a six month uh, literature survey. Doesn't make any sense. It actually doesn't make any sense at all because you actually waste a lot of time in that. So now in order to identify potential topics or potential problems, there are certain things which, which, which actually helps. So the first thing, of course, which I think Professor Nanan already mentioned this morning, is reading a lot of journal articles, okay? So you really have to, have to focus on devoting some time every day to read what is happening in your, in your field, okay? And when you're reading journal articles, try to read as many different journals as possible, okay? So of course, from your field, definitely, you don't want to read about computer science or, I don't know, electronics engineering. Something which is related to your field, your subject, but try to read as many different journals as possible, you know, like try to read like research articles, try to read reviews. Also what we say is like when you're reading journal articles, uh, there are always, you, you some, some of the journals, they have the, you know, the editorials. So these are also very, very useful information because you get a very good idea of the state of the art of that, of that particular field. Because you really know exactly what's going on, what's happening, what people are working on worldwide. So this is something which really gives you a very good overview of the field and also helps you to identify like, what could be the possible topics or possible problems that you could work on. So this is the first thing, of course, and reading journal articles does not only have one advantage, we'll talk about the others later, but it's like, yeah, we'll, we'll come to that later. And the second point is when you're talking of, uh, you know, like you're starting your PhDs and you're talking of like what to do and you're deciding you're still not sure what you want to work on, and maybe yeah, you read a lot of uh, journal articles, you're reading a lot of articles, a lot of papers. But of course it's true that you don't understand everything what you read, it's not possible. So what is always helpful is that if you can have journal clubs. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of a journal club here. Do you have anything called a journal club here? No, okay. So a journal club is something which is, uh, I think uh, you probably have it in the, in the Western countries a lot, uh, in the US and Europe, I know. 
so this is something which is very informal. It's a very informal gathering of your PhD students, PhD colleagues, your friends and peers. And what you do is you can organize it once a week or once a fortnight. So one of you from your group or your lab reads a paper. Any, any paper, it doesn't have to be, it should not be actually from your group, preferably from some, somewhere else, somewhere outside. You read the paper and then you come, you gather, and someone, whoever has read the paper, he or she presents the paper. Okay? So you just give a very informal talk on it. Yeah, it may be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you discuss it with your friends. Okay? So in the process, what happens is, you, maybe you didn't understand a lot when you read it the first time or the second time, but when you're presenting it and when you're sharing it and talking about it to your friends, it might appear that with the sharing of the information, somebody else might chip in with some, you know, some ideas which were not clear to you, but maybe they understood it better. So what happens in the process is that you not only you understand better, but you also you know, develop the habit of communicating what you read. And this is something which is also very important, which I realized in the last couple of days when I was here, I was listening to some of the, some of the talks in the afternoon session, that you, I mean, most of you have done a lot of good work, but when it comes to communicating, when it comes to presenting it, somehow something is lacking, all right? And if somebody is asking you a question, you're often at a loss. I don't know why, but you just don't have any answer. And that is, at least I can tell you, that is not good if for your future if you really intend to stay and continue with research. Okay? So you have to be confident about what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. You might not know everything, but at least you should have, always have some basic understanding and some plausible explanation for the questions that you, that you face. Okay? So that's about the journal club. So I think this is a very uh, useful and a very healthy practice if you can you know, like initiate it. It's always very useful. And the third and uh, very important uh, way of uh, identifying uh, topics uh, is this, attending conferences and events, big events, all right? This is a great opportunity, I believe, for young students, young PhDs, because the conferences are places where you meet a lot of people from outside. Like when I say outside, like outside your institute, all right? So you have an opportunity of meeting a lot of experts, as is the case here. So you have, yeah, like a five-day long like, course given by a very, very experienced professor here. And this is a great opportunity to learn, and not only to learn new things, but also to interact, all right? So you'll realize that when you attend these conferences, and if you are actually, you know, if you want to learn, if you wish to learn, and you meet these experienced uh, researchers, experienced academicians, and if you have questions, they're always very open to discuss, okay? They're very open to discuss, they're very open to share, and this is a great, I, I believe this is really a very, very good opportunity where you can actually, you know, not only learn a lot of things, but also realize that what you are doing, like what exactly you're doing, is it good, is it relevant, or how you should go about it, how you should do about it. Of course, you always have your seniors or your supervisors to advise you. But when you come to places like this, big conferences, big events, it really opens your view. It gives you a very wide exposure, which is actually very, very important in research. Okay? So this is, this is, these are some of, the, some of the key ways, I would say, which help you in identifying potential topics of research. Okay? How, like, what should you work on? What, what is the question you should address? What is happening? What, what could be more interesting? Or even if you are doing something, how, you can, you, how can you improve it? You know? So this, is, this, this, should be, this should be the idea. Okay, so that was about the introduction. So now, so this is how it should, like, you know, how an ideal introduction is look like. So basically, readers have to understand uh, the background a little bit, and then they should know exactly why you are doing the study. What is the whole objective? What is the whole purpose of doing it? Okay. So once you have the introduction, the second part, this, this, the second key question is the reader wants to know is what, what did you actually do, right? So this, of course, it comes in the method section. Now this is important, this method section is important for two reasons. First, of course, of course, it's important because it really helps other researchers to build on your work. And this is something very important because if others are not able to build on your work, 
it, your work doesn't have as such any impact. Okay, so you have to make sure that this this your 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 results or your your study it's reproducible because if it's not reproducible, remember any research work which is not reproducible doesn't have any credibility. All right, so that effectively means so there is some kind of error or some malpractice, some data fabrication or falsification as we call it. So you have to really make sure that you really describe your methods. We'll come to that in the next one. You talk, you give enough information in, in your paper, in your manuscript so that your readers, the researchers who are working in your field, they are able to reproduce your findings and not only that, they are able to build on that because until unless researchers or other, other scientists they are able to build on what you are doing, your work will not have any impact and if it doesn't have any impact, it won't get cited. So it loses the whole purpose of publi like, you know, publishing things. You're just publishing for the sake of publishing but nothing else. Okay, so not only, so the first one, the first um, group of people are the researchers uh, and it's not only them, it's also important this, this section, the method section because this is one of the first sections in your manuscript which is actually read carefully by the reviewers. So once you submit your article, it goes to the journal editor and the journal editor decides to send it for peer review. So this is something which the peer reviewers, they, they actually scrutinize in detail because it's very important for them to understand that you, the methods you have you've used are the correct ones, of course. Are they the good ones, the appropriate ones for your study? And also, are they up to date? Okay, so are you really using the latest methods or are you using something which is, you know, like very, very old and which doesn't have any relevance anymore, which is known to be inaccurate or which is known to be error prone, these kind of things. So if the, if the reviewer or the reviewers, they are not convinced about the methodology that you have used, they will immediately reject. They will recommend the journal editor to reject your paper. So that's why it's important that it's not only important for the researchers working in your immediate field, but it's also important from the peer review point of view. Okay, so like the thing is, so what do they, yeah, so right, so what in the method section, so what do they need to know? So what are the, what, what is the information exactly that your readers are looking for? So of course the first thing that you mention always is that who or what you have used in if you have done experiments, right? If you are doing experiments, you have to clearly mention like what kind of samples you have used, give a background of the samples, if you bought it from somewhere or if there are any particular specifications. So all these details, they should be provided here, okay? The kind of samples or materials you have used. So once you discuss that, of course, then you come to act the actual methods that you are using, the methodology, the te technology or the techniques that you're using. So here's some, something which I'd like to mention here is that when you're talking about your, like, you know, study design and you're talking about the experiments, let's say you're, ex you're using something very standard like, you know, AFM or SEM or TEM or these kind of things. So please don't go on describing how a whole transmission electron microscope works. Not required. Because everybody knows. At least people who are doing experiments, they know how a TEM works or how an F AFM works. Okay, but if it's something very, you know, like some, it's an experimental setup which was, in, which was really designed or built in your lab, in your group, something which is not really well known, maybe outside your community. In that case, you can always give a background of the experimental setup, the experimental design that you, that you have, that you've used for your experiments. The second point which is very important here is specific conditions. This is extremely important if you are talking about experiments, even people doing numerical simulations, if you are using models or any kind of, you know, these, data, uh, these coding packages. So you have to always be very careful to mention all kinds of assumptions or this kind of parameters you are using. So if you are doing experiments, be sure to mention the, 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 the specific controls like maybe temperature or pressure, etc. This is important. Why? Again, it brings, brings us back to the previous slide when we, was talking, when we were talking about reproducibility. Because if the reader doesn't have all this required information, then they will never be able to reproduce what you have done. Right? So, of course, you have to be sure that you mention all the important parameters and all the important control sets that you have done while performing your experiment or running your simulation. Okay? And of course, so once you talk about the method or the, technology, the techniques that you have used, so then it brings you to the data. So if you have used any, how did you like, you know, what kind of software or what kind of tools did you use to, to for, the, and, and, and 
for analyzing the data or the quantification of the data. And again, when you're talking about the quantification methods here, statistical, uh, statistical analysis or statistical tests are very important. For especially for those of you who are doing experiments because you know like people like to see numbers and maybe you have a lot of numbers you have a lot of data but you don't know how to interpret them or how to depict them how to show them so in in case when you're in doubt or you're not really sure okay so how, how do you go about presenting it or how do you actually you know, portray the data depict it so in those in those cases it's always advisable that you can consult a statistician Someone who is really a professional, someone who is working with a lot of statistics and a lot of data, because I think it's very useful to like seek the help of a statistician because he or she can directly advise you and tell you like what exactly how you should go about, you know, like doing the statistical analysis or portraying your data. You can always, of course, you can always consult your supervisor or your seniors, you know, but in case even, even they are not sure, right, they are in a doubt, you can always, the best idea is that you go to a statistician, you find out a statistician and you talk to him and you say that, okay, so this is my data, this is what I have, this is what I want to show, what I would like to show, so how do I go about it, okay? So this is what actually you cover in the, in the methods section when you're talking about your, uh, the methods, the methodology part. And once you do that, so you come to the results, right? So of course, this is something which the readers are like, more interested in. So this, when we talking about the results, so this is something which we always uh, say that when you start writing the results section, try to divide the results section into subsections, all right? So try to make, make divide it into subsections, give small headings, okay? And guide the readers step by step. So what does that mean? So when you start talking about your results, you just go figure by figure, okay? So don't try to give too much information together. So what we call is avoid information overload, all right? Because you have to remember that your ideas, your work might be very simple to you. You're very, very familiar with all of it, but it's not very simple to the reader, right? They are not familiar with what you have done or how you've done or what you found or what you, what you were showing. So it's, of course, if you want to be a good communicator, you really have to guide the reader step by step through the, through the results. So when you start discussing your, discuss, uh, sorry about describing your, your, your results, your findings, you just go one figure at a time, okay? So you just start with something like figure one shows that, or in figure two we see that, or figure three depicts that, so that the reader knows exactly where to look Okay, so that he doesn't have to go on hunting for you know, information. And also avoid jumping from one to another. So you're discussing, you're talking about figure one, talk about figure one. Okay, don't refer to figure three, and then when you're talking about figure three, don't refer back to figure two. Sometimes, okay, I know it's unavoidable, but try as much as you can to avoid this kind of, you know, like jumping back and forth. Because then it becomes very difficult for the reader to follow what you're doing or what you actually want to say. So that's, that's what is about, yeah, about the, when you're talking about your, your results. And the other thing which I would like